What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. Today, we have Gabriella Coleman. Gabriella is a cultural anthropologist and assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. And um, she's interested in research and rights on politics and science, media, and technology. And she had a recent essay in the MIT Press anthology, Tactical Biopolitics, Art, Activism, and techno science. Um, so welcome to Madness Radio, Gabriella Coleman. Thank you, Will. So today is our opportunity to get really big and think about the larger social issues and historical patterns that go into shaping um, activism and human rights struggles around mental health and madness and um, what we're calling the Mad Pride movement. We'll get into what that means, Mad Pride. And I just want to welcome you, welcome you to the show. Thanks again. Well, I'm very excited to be able to talk about this um, topic with you today. Yeah, you just came out with an essay in uh, this anthology, Tactical Biopolitics, and I was really impressed by the way in which you look at the whole history of um, what we're calling consumer survivor activism and the movement. And the um, people who don't know, who are listening, um, you know, they may have heard about the Freedom Center, they may have heard about the Icarus Project, but we're part of a movement that really started in the late 70s with very radical um, uh, ex-patient, ex-mental patient activism, especially around Berkeley and in the Northeast, um, calling for very dramatic changes, very allied to radical and revolutionary movements that were happening in other parts of society as well. Is that is that kind of an accurate assessment? Absolutely. I mean, it, um, the sort of uh, movement and critique against psychiatry arose especially in the early to uh, mid-1970s, and kind of followed the wave of uh, civil rights activism, um, anti-war protests, the sort of radical milieu of the late 60s and 1970s. And to sort of contextualize how radical it was, in a sense, um, you know, many people do not know this, but if you were a mental health patient and entered a hospital or were uh, forced to enter a hospital, you lost your civil liberties. You lost your right to have a license to marry, to vote. So in many ways, these were kind of coded as non-humans by virtue of their condition, and then all of a sudden, um, they've banded together under a kind of politics that demanded uh, human rights and a very strong political voice. So it was quite, quite radical at the time. And a lot of the changes that we take for granted now... um uh, for example, just the the right to have a psychiatric history and to have license and all the things that you mentioned, and also appearing before a judge and needing some kind of consent, all those things that are considered just part of the mental health system now really came from very radical street activism. Um, there was you know many changes underfoot at the time, but if we're not um, especially for patients involved who had sort of gone through the trauma, the dehumanizing aspects of being put through the mental health system, these changes would have never come about. And this was really an anti-psychiatry movement. I mean, it was about abolishing electroshock, um, ending any kind of forced treatment, getting rid of drugs. I mean, it was, it was very much a, a kind of a politics that is, has really been pushed to the fringes today. One of the um, trends I track in my article is how in this context of the 1970s, uh, because it had sort of been so many problems associated with psychiatry, whether it was the asylum, electric shock treatment, these uh, laws, in some ways, all the while the politics of the time were quite radical, the activists were situated in a context that was very open to these ideas. And then in the sort of subsequent decade, especially in the 1980s, psychiatry reinvented itself to become a legitimate enterprise um, in the eyes of the greater public. And faced with these new conditions, and we can talk a little bit more about those new conditions, survivors were, in a sense, marginalized once again. 
as being completely crazy for contesting a psychiatry that didn't seem to have the types of problems it had in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And so in many ways in this article, I then trace the development of new tactics and strategies by which um, a newer generation, as well as the older generation of survivors, were able to respond in this new context, which made it harder for people to take them seriously, as had once been the case. I think it's really interesting to, to trace the the sort of distinction between survivors and consumers, and um, there's a whole history just of the the language, um, and of course that's survivor versus consumer is kind of a shorthand for the people who are more working inside the system, and then the people who are more um, outside of it and and shut out in a lot of ways. Although it's not quite that simple, and I, and I want to get into this whole dynamic of how movements, um, because I know you've written about it quite a bit about how movements start out very having a lot of integrity and really clear visions and then suddenly they they right. fall short and they get become reformist and then they don't quite get all the things that they want and then the the real basic message has been kind of lost um but before we get into that i just wanted to to mention you mentioned the civil rights movement and the activist movements of the times the women's movement was incredibly important mm. for the rise of anti-psychiatry and for the survivors movement in fact that model of taking people's interpersonal experience. This happened to me. Let me talk about my suffering in my private life and then connecting it with the larger political goals mm -hmm. and the political movement was really influenced by the women's movement. So many different levels, everything from the personal can be political and the personal in the sense of what happens to my body, right? And that we have a right to control that to the fact that the women's movement at the time also focused on women's health issues in a way that hadn't happened before, and that was the dawn of sort of patient activism in general, uh, which has completely exploded, especially in the last 10 years, thanks to Internet technologies. But it was definitely the women's movement that helped um, open the door to that. So the women's movement really identified patterns of hierarchy and domination, not just um, in society at large, but within political groups and uh, for example, the women's movement um, in the second wave of feminism really came up with the idea of consensus. And this influenced all sorts of political groups from sort of um, anarchism to the environmental movement. I mean, it really was a sort of wellspring, and it influenced um, the rise of psychiatric survivors as well. I think it's really interesting what you said about, um, you know, the women's movement really spearheading all patient activism. We, we think of kind of patients um, having the right to, to talk back to their doctors and to challenge policy and to mobilize and organize. I and mean, we think of that as just taken for granted. But uh, 60s and 70s, I mean, doctors were the law. I mean, it's still a little bit true, but there was this social attitude of just being completely unquestioned, of completely not questioning doctors. And then the women's movement kind of broke through that. And then the mental health, the psychiatric survivors kind of continued that challenge to doctor authority. And it's really important to unearth this history because on the one hand, first of all, it's so recent, right? The 1970s really is just um, right around our historical corner in a sense. But also I think it's important to keep this in mind because on the one hand, while we can track some major improvements, right, there is an expectation that patients of all kind of uh, flavors and kinds have a voice. They can talk back to their doctors. There's still many sort of informal norms which reassert the old hierarchies which were more formal in the past. Which is especially true in terms of the pharmaceutical companies and the way the whole thing has been turned into this disease that you have to sort of be an expert to really understand the neurochemistry and you have to sort of trust the, the pill. Um, before we get into that, I wanted to ask you, what are some examples of the kinds of activism that was going on in the 70s um, with the psychiatric survivor movement? It was um, quite multifaceted. On the one hand, it was, uh, I'm going to say it was very national and it was very local. So there was different collectives that popped up in places like Vancouver, Toronto, uh, New York, San Francisco, uh, the big cities. They produced newsletters which circulated locally and across the country. Um, there were pickets at um, the meetings, the annual meetings for uh, psychiatry, the APA meetings. Um, they also had conferences, and this was probably one of the most important um, events. Conferences bring together people from all these communities, and it provides a sort of certain 
strength um, and momentum to the movement. People who had never talked about these issues with each other or openly, I mean, it's a real dramatic coming out of the closet, coming out of the of the shadows. And I know one of the things that w- happened was that there were pickets against electroshock. And I think Berkeley, California, actually passed an anti-electroshock ordinance at one point. There was also um, publication of lists of doctors who did electroshock, and there was people trying to target them at their um, at their home. So it's very militant kind of spirit to this uh, to this movement. So militant, in fact, that there was a kind of complete, utter critique of psychiatry um, and a space for thinking about madness in new ways as well, right? To also, and this is, I think, the other element about the uh, radical underside of this movement is not just the critique of psychiatry, is the revaluation of madness itself. Something is seen uh, traditionally as wholly negative, was cast in sort of a new light as well. For people who are listening, they might might think that that's just like really extreme and really radical, but it's very important to remember that the militancy um, that the psychiatric survivor movement um, bust out with really opened up something that had not been opened up before. And if we did not have that militancy, we would not be where we are today. That's true of the women's movement. It's true of the environmental movement. It's true of the... Um, the civil rights movement, the black power movement. It's also true in mental health uh, reforms. Let's talk about this idea of redefining normal and uh, mad pride and what you mentioned about the larger critique um, that was implicit in the work that was going on with psychiatric survivors. You know, when uh, politics first emerge, uh, so-called madness, mental illness, along with all sorts of disabilities, and this is something we can talk about a little bit later, is this convergence between disability and madness. Um, Madness was quoted as something 100, beyond 100% negative, right? Something you would absolutely want to get rid of, something that you would hide, something that should never be public, something of which there was a tremendous amount of shame shrouded around. And again, part of the most important work, and there's still so much work to be done in this arena, was shedding the stigma of these experiences to show the world that there were positive elements to it, to show the world that, you know, madness is part of the human condition to some degree. So I'm thinking in terms of creativity, in terms of people's sensitivity, spirituality, is that the kind of positive side to madness that um, the movement started promoting? Recognition that there's creative elements, that you're sensitive to the world and its tragedies. Um, that it's, again, part of the human condition to feel these range of um, emotions and experiences. But again, what's interesting, and um, this is sort of, I would say, a later development in, a f- in terms of the full recognition, um, and this is very true for the disability rights activism movement as well, you can recognize the positive elements of these conditions all the while seeking forms of therapy and help at the same time. It doesn't have to be a romanticization or a saying that we don't need help or we don't need society's um, assistance or a society's accommodation. I'm thinking about um, the movement of people who have different hearing or who are deaf and don't hear the way that we hear. I mean, there may be a need to accommodate them, but a lot of those folks are just saying, look, we're different. We don't necessarily want to regain our hearing in the normal so-called way. We want to value the positive side of what we're having in what's called a disability, which is one of the reasons I like the phrase diverse ability instead of disability. Absolutely. And in order to make sure that diversity is visible, people with different sort of orientations and capacities are given equal footing, you do have to sort of re-architect services, um, society at large. And again, this is why these projects at first may seem contradictory, but actually are not contradictory. In order to make diversity visible, you have to sort of change things like social services. That's a really important point. And let's, um, I don't want to get too much into this because it's it's a giant topic, but what are your thoughts about how society could accommodate diverse mental abilities? I mean, we have wheelchair ramps for people who are moving around differently. We have um, TTY machines for people who hear differently. Um, What kinds of accommodations would madness need for if society was truly to embrace diversity? Well, one, I would say, would have to be a kind of shift of consciousness and conceptualization. 
um, that's actually in some ways the most important. There's a re- you know um, there's a recognition that someone in a wheelchair can contribute in many ways, um, and there's not a sort of extreme sort of prejudice against them. I still think with many forms of mental illness, especially uh, ones that are traditionally labeled as bipolar or schizophrenia, there, there are. So I think just basically new perceptions need to arise, and people need to have more kind of positive experiences and representations. I think this is crucial, 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 crucial. Um, how one would do that, I mean, already changes have happened in that regard, but there's a lot more to do. Otherwise, I think um, accommodations have to come in the realm of things like housing, better access to housing, better access to alternative therapies, for example, the recognition that um, maybe sort of spaces uh, for work, also a recognition that people may have to come in and out of the workplace in a sense, what sort of jobs could it accommodate for that sort of thing. But right now we have no resources, I think, for things like affordable housing and alternative therapies. I was just thinking that it really ties into the broader social needs, which I think is important, um, especially considering that the psychiatric survivor movement originated in the broader context of a social justice movement. I mean, all the things that pressurize someone that turn their mental states into crisis and um, get them into trouble and get them into hospitals are totally related to the economy. They're related to politics. Right. Um, I know you mentioned the women's movement, and one of the things that the women's movement has been addressing and, and led um, consciousness around was child abuse and the way in which violence and trauma devastate people. And women are especially affected by this, but it also plays a really key role in mental health and why people end up going to psychiatrists and ending up in hospitals. There's a sort of added layer of trauma when there's a crisis that may be happening and then you know you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your housing, all these sorts of things and add this other layer of crisis. If those things aren't taken care of, then people who are undergoing this don't have a shot at all. That seems to be the first step is to to stop um, adding to the problem by traumatizing people who uh, need help, um, who are going through emotional distress. I mean, that's unfortunately where we are in the society right now. And it goes even deeper than that because there was recently a study that came out where um, is a brilliant is a brilliant study. It was put together partly by Ed Knight, who I've had on the show before. They were able to um, demonstrate in the study that by having a threat of forcing someone to the hospital against their will actually interferes with people getting help around suicide. Because if right. you if you are suicidal you don't. You can't talk to your therapist or talk to your doctor or talk to people around you, talk to professionals especially, because they may be mandated by law to report you, and they may get into trouble if they don't basically bring down the police and the hospitals and then force you into the hospital. So a lot of people just don't talk. I mean, I often counsel people, look, be careful. If you're going to talk about suicide, be, be very aware that, because personally my story was, I didn't know that my therapist had that power. Mm. And, um, so, you know, just, that just gives you an example of an accommodation issue and the freedom center and the Icarus project have been really pushing this, that we need the freedom to talk about suicide and talk about cutting and talk about our crisis without having the big brother in the room of someone's going to decide to, haul us off and it's always done in the name of helping people but look we've had you know hundreds of years of hurting people in the Mm. name of helping people and there are much better ways to do it than just forcing them forcing them into the hospital because we're afraid that um, something is going to happen if we don't i wanted to back up and and we mentioned um, the queer movement and gay pride and there's this slogan uh, mad pride let's talk about that a little bit because it's both a, a powerful slogan in the sense of embracing the positive side of people's experience, but it's also really tricky and it has a lot of complicated aspects to it. It's it's interesting to um, understand changes in, let's say, the militant side of psychiatric survivors in light of uh, queer politics, because queer politics has this tension between um, a sort of embrace of the politics of shame versus the politics of pride. Uh, where the pride sort of movement looks to things like gay marriage, being accepted. But while they're doing that, they also let go of other elements of their politics, such as um, shame, sexuality, making um, questions of queerness public 
in the sort of larger sense. And so it points to... Bella, can you say a little bit more about that in terms of, I know that the um, gay rights movement, there's been a struggle around, for example, include, including transgender people. Uh, there's also been a struggle around embracing um, more sexual minority um, sexual practices like SM or radical sexuality or the sex worker movement, because kind of the gay pride side of things wants to say, well, look, we're just like everybody else. We're wholesome. We're apple pie. We can fit in. We're not going to kind of rock the boat of American normalcy. We're just a little bit different because our partners are the same gender. <laughs> absolutely. Whereas the queer side of that spectrum says absolutely not. Uh, we can't create those boundaries because it was those boundaries that didn't allow us to be accepted in the first place, right? And so they're kind of pushing the boundaries to include all sorts of other people in their in their net that uh, gay pride is not willing to include. At the same time, gay pride then has a message that is, since it's more palpable to a wider kind of uh, audience, you know, the positive element is that it touches more people, perhaps. And in that sense, I think it's important to have both a gay pride and a kind of queer politics. I think it's important to have a uh, radical psychiatric survivor politics as well as a more reformist consumer politics. And we can talk a little bit more about why it's important to have both, in a sense. It reminds me of when I worked with the Earth Island Institute in um, San Francisco. Um, you know, the environmental movement has a lot of the same dynamics that we're mm -hmm. talking about in terms of the more it's kind of mainstream, traditional, let's let's make some small reformist changes, and then the more radical extreme, let's get into tree sits and let's blockade um, roads and let's do demonstrations. And um, David Brower, who was the founder of the Earth Island Institute, um, he said something I thought was really interesting. He said that he liked Earth First, Earth First being a very radical and uh, environmental movement. Um, he likes Earth First because Earth First makes the rest of us environmentalists look more reasonable. And the reason that makes so much sense is that it kind of, if you have people who are very out there, then the folks who are pushing for things that might have been seen as radical a few years ago start to seem more reasonable. And then you actually start to get cultural cultural acceptance and cultural change. I'm going to go off on a little digression, but I think this point is crucial. It's crucial. This is why in the sort of greater American political sphere, we have such a problem, is because you only have conservative and liberals and really nothing left of center. And hence the change that can happen at that level is really minimal. But I think in questions of queer politics and psychiatry, because you have these two kind of poles who are in conversation with each other, and so long as one is still visible, it does make the moderate seem more moderate and more acceptable people to sort of turn to them, to listen to them, and to learn from them. Right now, there's a really big movement to just to, to say to the world, look, we do not take medications, and we have mental health issues, and that's fine. That's our way to do it. It's a big movement. It's underground. There are thousands of us out there. And I think that culturally, having that there really makes it more able for the cultural to start critic for the culture to start criticizing medications and then suddenly you've got the New York Times coming out with editorials criticizing um, the pharma pr corruption and and challenging the the medications um, in ways that the movement was talking about five years ago and six years ago but then the movement kind of you know is still at these at this level of having very strong values and a great deal of integrity but then it kind of bubbles up so that the ideas start to seem a little bit more moderate and become more accepted by the mainstream there wasn't sort of that let's say fountain of radicalism pushing in very interesting ways, then I don't think it ever has the chance to then, as you say, bubble. I think that's a great word because that's exactly what has happened under the right conditions, right? And what have those conditions been? You know, those conditions in the last five years, there's been these major pharmaceutical scandals, major, not just with pharm um, psychiatric drugs, but also other drugs such as uh, Vioxx, right? And all of a sudden, the sort of intertwinement between medicine and pharma has been exposed and it sort of lends itself then towards um, making the radical messages coming out of uh, survivor politics compelling, real, something that people must listen to in a sense. But if, the, if, if it didn't exist, right, that would be a real loss in a sense. But this is important because I think oftentimes people involved in more radical politics 
there's moments where society at large can't listen, but you still must continue on and forge, right? Moments of opportunity that that kind of um, happen where the message then has an ability to come out. And I think um, the last two years have been so important for psychiatry and the critique of psychiatry. So if you're listening and you're someone who's who's promoting, uh, you know, trying to get the mental health system to be a little bit more kind, a little bit co- more compassionate, and you feel like those activists over there at the Freedom Center and the Icarus Project and other uh, other groups that have um, survivor politics and and a stronger message, they're, they're really kind of too extreme. Well, actually, we might be really connected. We might actually be all helping each other, helping the society to, to change. Biela, you mentioned something about reformism, and I wanted to talk about the other side of uh, this dynamic, which is when groups that have a lot of integrity and a really clear vision, and of course they get seen as more radical groups, when opportunities happen and then people who are maybe in the leadership of those groups move on to paid positions, and suddenly there's this co-optation that happens. Let's talk about the consumer movement, because I think there's a, a there's undoubtedly wonderful, positive changes that have happened because of the recovery movement and because of the consumer movement. I absolutely support that movement. At the same time, there is this co-optation dynamic, and I've seen issues be banned and silenced, organizers and groups be pushed away from discussions, an absolute taboo on things like saying, I have a schizophrenia diagnosis, I do not take medication, people being told they can't talk about forced drugging or they can't be critical of this or can't be critical of that. So there is this co-optation dynamic that also happens. We, and we saw that happen with a survivor politics, um, especially in the period between 1980 and 1990 is really when we saw the rise in consolidation of consumer politics, um, and it, there was various kind of forces that helped propel it. We've already talked about some of the sort of positive elements, but some of the negative elements are they have a much narrower window in terms of their message, who they can include, what avenues of politics they can engage in. They can't do anything sort of risky or risque for all sorts of reasons, losing their positions of power, losing their credibility, right? Right. I have a really good example of that is that I was recently at a at a conference, a very major conference of the consumer movement, and you would think mental health, well, let's talk about medications, but medications itself was a taboo at the conference, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of effort had to go into getting um, a workshop that I um, presented on coming off medications, and I did actually present the workshop, but it was very difficult, and there was problems getting the support and it kind of was undermined a bit and and so that's a really concrete example of how the basic needs that the movement is is promoting and the basic changes that the movement um, is uh, promoting um, when co-optation happens those sort of drop away and they get forgotten and they get pushed down and what also happens is oftentimes the more reformist movement legitimizes the changes that are undergoing in the institutions and practices that are being critiqued so that they can say, hey, we're changing, we're changing, we're paying attention to you all. And so then they become a little bit more impervious to critique because they say, hey, we're responding to a politics, right? Do you see the dynamic there? So then you have to fight against that dynamic in a sense. I, I really see that. The um, the word transformation, I mean, the uh, President Bush's new Freedom Commission, which if people don't know, is a, is a blueprint for transforming the mental health system. There's a lot of really strong uh, language in there about it's broken, we've got to fix it. A lot of language that's taken from the survivor movement, but then the actual substance of it is really very, very reformist and very, very limited. If you're just joining us, this is Madness Radio, and uh, today's guest is Gabriella Coleman. She is a cultural anthropologist and assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University, and we are talking about MAD movement lessons and strategies. Uh, Biela, we don't have a lot of time. There's so much to talk about, but I wanted to um, get into something we were mentioning before the interview, which is just the, the larger social changes that are happening around pharmaceuticals and drugs and the use of drugs. And uh, the example that I was saying was um, baseball. And we think, you know, 
it's hard to think of something that's more essentially American than baseball. And baseball is utterly corrupted by the use of performance enhancing drugs. And do you think that really this is part the, the question of mental health, um, pharmaceutical company promoting drugs and people getting medication prescriptions, that this is really part of the society moving towards um, performance enhancing drugs in general and everyone getting on drugs to change their consciousness or change their bodies in some way? It's a great question, and I think it is an extraordinarily important um, set of transformations we need to pay attention to, which is the fact that uh, traditionally drugs have been seen as uh, therapy for returning someone to normalcy, whereas now there's all sorts of drugs which now are pushing the boundaries of what the normal means, and there's a kind of embrace of creating super normal conditions. You're stronger, you're faster, you can concentrate more, you feel happier, right? Even the uh, holistic health movement kind of buys into this with a lot of supplements being sold to make you, you know, elevate your mood and to really you know, enhance you in the ways that you're describing. On the one hand, I think that there is compelling evidence that there are people who turn to the, both the supplements and the drugs to enhance themselves. They feel fine, but because of the pressures of... Uh, just American society, where we value performance, where we value people always being on, where we value kind of happiness. All these elements create the conditions to um, to pressure people into experimenting with these drugs. And after a period of experimenting, if there's enough people taking them, it's no longer seen as you know, a problem. It becomes the norm. On the other hand, a more sympathetic reading, I think there's people out there who are uh, truly don't feel well. They're overworked. They're tired. There's tremendous, you know, there's the rise of chronic fatigue. There's all sorts of conditions out there that sort of point to a very unhealthy society. We're worked to uh, the limits. There's not enough time off. The food we're eating is poisoned. And I think some people turn to both the drugs and supplements to compensate for the shortcomings of the sort of life we lead. So you can see how there are sort of two different trends. But they both then, at the surface level, work to reaffirm and embrace of, let's just say, the solution from the pill or the herb versus sort of more important social transformations that would need to happen to, to not use those solutions. So it's about changing people's bodies and minds to fit into this productive capitalist machine culture that we have. Some people are aware of it in the sense that they're run down, they feel po poisoned, they know that there's environmental toxins. So this is one of the reasons why they're doing it. They want to get rid of the toxins in their body, they, they want to overcome their feel feelings of tiredness, they know that they're part of the kind of capitalist machines. And then there's others who are not aware of the kind of political dynamics, but are also uh, turning to these drugs for similar reasons. And within this context, you can see how pharmaceutical drugs for, uh, you know, mental illnesses then becomes the path you take and increasingly the path children take at a very young age. Yeah. What are some of the developments that are happening right now? I mean, I know that there's a number of, of scandals and a lot of uh, activity in terms of, of critiquing pharmaceutical companies to some degree happening right now. How does that um, playing out, and how do you think maybe the movement fits into that? So um, the scandals you are referring to are the fact that um, all sorts of very famous psychiatrists, the most famous one is uh, Dr. Joseph Biederman of Harvard, has kind of deep ties with the pharmaceutical industry. And it's just one instance. Um, it's a important instance to pay attention to because through his work, his publications, and his institutions, he has kind of mandated uh, therapeutic drugs for, you know, bipolar children, in a sense. And there's been a tremendous rise in diagnoses of uh, the bipolar uh, condition for children, and the solution has been drugs. I think it's been about 4,000% in the last 10 years. Is that right? It has been astronomical astronomical. And the Biederman case is um, kind of the extreme, but it reflects much, much larger trends. 
Well, and he's really considered one of the most reputable, prestigious, famous, important psychiatrists on the planet. I mean, he has been considered the expert on uh, bipolar and especially, you know, helping kids that are seen as bipolar. And it turns out that he's hiding the fact that he's taking money from pharmaceutical companies and promoting their marketing interests. Right. And very aware of the fact that they're doing it as the recent editorial in the New York Times has shown, right? And why it's so disturbing is um, everything from the fact that children have no say, right, in what is happening to their bodies. And so I think it really is a form of human rights abuse. To the fact that we have, well, we already know that the kind of long-term consequences of being on these drugs can be disastrous. But especially for children whose uh, brains haven't completely formed, who are undergoing a lot of transformations in their bodies, we're literally um, experimenting with them in ways that I know in, in 30 years we'll see is atrocious. And this is what, where I think survivor politics are so important is because they have a historical memory of this dynamic where a new therapy is seen always as an improvement of what came before, right? And there's been so many different iterations of this. They're the ones who can sort of legitimately say, this is what's going on right now as well. What kinds of lessons do you think the um, survivor movement and people who are mental health activists should get from the kinds of insights that you're talking about, especially given where we are now, which seems like there's a change going on. I mean, we have a Democratic administration uh, coming in. There's a lot more criticism of pharmaceutical companies and the corruption of the science and the research. What sort of lessons and, and vision and strategy would you recommend given where we are right now? Well, I would say two things, one of which they've absolutely already done. There's been, I think, a tremendous amount of internal flexibility in um, survivor politics. I, I often describe it as a radical but not pure politics. And by that, I mean um, even while they have a lot of integrity, a very clear social message, um, they don't want to replicate the structures of domination. So they have a message that says, we understand that there's different ways to treat people which is why it's sort of a pro-choice movement all the while, I think, again, being radical. And so I would just encourage to think about that flexibility and be very um, conscious of it. Yeah, that's something we talk about in the Freedom Center quite a bit is that we don't, you know, we have a critique of psychiatrists, but we don't want to become like psychiatrists and tell everybody, oh, everybody should get off medications or, or even everybody should do yoga. Or The idea is more to present a whole menu of options for people and to have people explore for themselves what is, um, what is working for them or not working for them. And that's a, that's a very um, empowering message. It's, a, it's so many of activist movements sometimes can be very domineering and very like we have the one right way of doing things. And I think that there are a lot of us in the movement are really trying to get beyond that rigid kind of thinking because that's part of what's problem with psychiatry and mental health to begin with. Right, exactly. And this is something that other activists should look to uh, survivors to learn. How can you be uh, radical but not pure and really think about the dynamics that would be replicating that which you're critiquing? And um, this is just, again, something I've admired and it's great to hear people talk about it, continue to talk about it, because I think any politics, especially a radical one, can fall prey to a certain type of inflexibility. And I haven't seen that at all, but it's, again, always important to keep that kind of on the surface. The second thing is I think this is, this is a moment. The next five, ten years can be crucial. Everything from the fact that the pharmaceutical industry has been exposed to the fact that Americans are um, clearly sick and tired of um, not having something like universal health care. And, you know, there is some risk to universal health care when it comes to mental health, right? Um, and we can talk about this. At the same time, there is a recognition that we need better services and to demand this of the government, in a sense. And there's so many different arenas where science is being corrupted um, in the name of profit. And so if alliances can be built... Uh, between survivors and, let's just say, uh, environmentalists, for example, who are criticizing the plastics industry for creating bottles that basically have chemicals that cause neurological problems in children, right? 
the case of survivors is not isolated. So I think building bridges to kind of um, other projects that have similar concerns about the corruptibility and closeness of science and medicine is an important tactic to explore. I really like that point, and I think this raises the whole question of the dangers of funding, because mm. if you get funding from, say, a federal source, um, if you get funding from, say, a grant, um, foundation grant, they have a very specific agenda. They want to focus on mental health, but they don't want to focus on homelessness. They want to focus on the environment, but they don't want to deal with racism. And so to make the kinds of bridges and alliances that must be made because the issues are connected, you have to kind of buck a lot of the traditional way of framing things in the charity, philanthropy, foundation world. Um, you mentioned something I thought was really interesting about universal um, health care, and it, it's tricky. Mental health politics is complicated because kind of the Democrat liberal wing says we need more spending on health care, and then the sort of the Republican conservative wing, and I'm making a caricature here, would say, well, we need less government spending and more free market. And the um, survivor movement and mental health politics really needs to take a more complicated view because it's not just spend more money which the pharmaceutical companies love to hear, especially when they can get a deal on Medicaid right. where there's no there's no competition on their prices. Um, but we also want to say what kinds of healthcare, what kinds of services, what what kinds of um, products are we promoting? What kinds of care are we actually funding in society? And that makes the issue a lot more complicated. With universal healthcare, often there's one model that's associated with that, and that's not the only model we want. The way I view it is, is somewhat pragmatically is um, it's tremendous the amount of people who, for example, can't even engage in politics in the society because they must have a full-time job for health care because, you know, accidents happen. You can get a sort of severe case of pneumonia, be in the hospital for two weeks, and be in a $50,000 debt, right? And so my feeling is once you have at least universal health care to deal with um, the um, less complicated medical health problems, you can get people kind of engaging in politics and then transform that to allow for a much more kind of inclusive, robust idea of what health means. And to give you a good example of this, you know, while Canada is by no means perfect um, in many respects when it comes to the health care system and their mental health care system, um, because they do have universal health care, many employers provide alternative health insurance to their employees and very, very um, robust packages where they cover acupuncture and naturopath and massage. And they're only able to do that because the sort of basic health care has been uh, covered. So I think there's a way in which you can advocate for universal health care all the while with a strong recognition that it needs to go much further than that. But if you don't have that, you can't go beyond it. I think it's a really good point because we don't want to be so pure that we say, oh, well, we're not going to actually promote universal health coverage for mental health issues because it's it's not there yet. And the reality is that for a lot of people, just getting any kind of treatment is going to be helpful. I did an interview um, with a homeless advocate, and um, the, the reality is that a lot of people just they, they, they can't even afford any medication that they're prescribed. Um, they don't get any they don't get any um, access to a therapist or a psychiatrist at all. And this is really a big issue for a lot of people. We have to remember the two sides of the issue, access to any treatment and then access to choice of what kind of treatment they're really, they're really together. Exactly. And if there's no sort of access to treatment, you can forget about choice. So I want to get that, you know, secured and then we can definitely and we must move beyond that. Gabriella, tell us about the research that you're doing now and what, um, what your next steps are in, in terms of um, looking at these issues. I uh, was trained in part as a medical anthropologist, and one aspect to the project on psychiatric survivors, there's kind of two layers, one of which is going to compare survivor politics to chronic Lyme disease activists. Uh, they're a good comparison because, on the one hand, um, survivor politics are sort of fighting the over-medicalization of their condition, and on the other hand, chronic Lyme disease is often not accepted as a real illness. Um, so they're fighting the under-medicalization of their condition. And if um, another interesting layer is that they're often accused of having uh, mental illness, right? 
So it's a very interesting uh, group of patients to bring together. And so layered upon that, I'm very interested in uh, peer-to-peer knowledge exchange among uh, patients and peers um, and sort of the use of the internet both for facilitating counter expertise, how to help each other through their condition, as well as how it's facilitated um, a kind of broader politics. Because one thing that's definitely the case was with survivors, there was sort of a period in time where the kind of radical element was a bit submerged, not as public. And the Internet definitely helped um, to facilitate a more public presence. And as a media scholar, I'm very interested in um, the use of these new technologies to facilitate a more robust politics. We don't have a lot of time, but we talked about the gay rights uh, movement, and I know that a lot of the push of AIDS activists was to get more money for research and to push pharmaceutical companies to spend more for pills and to get the research and the clinical trials process to be speeding up. Um, Do you think that this really influenced a lot, um, the thinking about mental health, that, well, we just need better drugs and we need to put more money into research to come up with with better medications? You know, it was a very positive element, but I think one of the negative consequences was in many different realms, and I think mental health was especially one of them, is, okay, we just need to find that gene. We just need to find that gene, and then we'll have the treatment, right? And that's awfully narrow, in a sense. Um, A, I'm skeptical that will be found. Um, And even if it were, I'm not so sure a treatment could be found that then would respond to that, right? And so in some ways, all these resources and energies get poured into a narrow kind of solution as opposed to the solutions that we need, which are far more complicated because they require, you know, all sorts of services and support that are not to be found in a pill, in a sense. All the while, I think with some other conditions, it is important to kind of pressure the government um, and different uh pharmaceutical companies to pursue things they would not pursue. But unfortunately for mental health, I think that there is plenty of research being done in the area, plenty of money being poured into finding pharmaceutical solutions, and energy must be diverted elsewhere. We need a kind of act up that does the kind of um, opposite of what they did. Gabriella, we are about out of time. Can you just give us a way to contact you and then also mention your um, essay in the book that just came out as well? Sure. Um, I could be contacted. I'm going to give my email address, which is B-I-E-L-L-A at N-Y-U dot E-D-U. If you Google my name, Gabriella, with a double L, Coleman, with a C-O-L-E-M-A-N. You'll uh, get access to my blog, my website. I'm very easy to find on the Internet. I welcome any kind of questions and queries. Um, And as you've mentioned, I've recently published a piece on um, the radical politics of psychiatric survivors from the 1970s to today in tactical biopolitics, uh, art activism, and technoscience, released by MIT Press. Gabriella Coleman, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you, Will. You've been listening to an interview with Gabriella Coleman. Uh, Gabriella is a cultural anthropologist. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU, focusing on politics and science of media and technology. That's all for this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Don't, 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 don't.